last week, as we're going through the Apostles' Creed, I noticed <clears throat> when we got to the place where it said the Holy Catholic Church, everyone started to mumble a little bit because you're like, why? Why is this in here? I didn't think we were like, I didn't think we were the Pope people and we're not the Pope people. Uh, again, just in case you weren't here last week, because it'll be in this week's creed as well. Uh, this was before really the Roman Catholic Church as it exists now existed. And the Catholic Church, as far as the creeds are concerned, and the way that we're using it today, like small c Catholic, not, not capital C Roman Catholic Church, just means the entirety of the actual church, like the, the invisible church the people that belong to Jesus across the globe today. That's what, it, that's what we mean when we say in the creeds, the Catholic Church, that's what it means. It doesn't mean hats and frocks and smells and bells and popes and Rome and that kind of stuff. So kind of, if you can, if you can distinguish those things in your mind, then with full gusto, you can read this word when we get to the word and not go, <laughs> church, like we did last week. Um, Again, just two, two kind of notes for today. So, and as far as the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the earliest creeds, we do, we've got creeds in Scripture as well. We actually get to one of those creeds when we get back into 1 Corinthians. By the time we get to chapter 15, there's, a, there's like a song or a creed even in the Scriptures. And the creeds that we use today, or some people use today, that we look to today as not authoritative like Scripture, but, but a very helpful distillation of Scripture. So there are people, uh, this creed that we're going to read today the, the, from the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed from, from Nicaea, uh, 325 AD, so next year, 1700 years ago. It's a long time ago, where a bunch of bishops of the church, and again, don't think big pointy hats and Roman Catholic Church, think overseers, people who are looking after congregations and, and areas of churches, got together because people had started to say things that weren't true about Jesus. And so they were reading in Scripture and going, oh, this is what I think Scripture says, and importing their own ideas into Scripture. And it's kind of, not a choose your own adventure, largely people were in agreement, but there were some who started preaching different things about Jesus, for example. Like this guy called Arius, the guy who, again, as legend has it, Santa punched in the face or slapped at least. Again, I'm not condoning that kind of violence. But Santa was pretty awesome. Well, people who had started to not just tell lies about Jesus unhealthily, but they were leading people astray to worship different versions of God who have no power at all to save, who, who don't actually exist. And so this group of Christian leaders that got together in Nicaea 325, got together to say, you know what? There's a lot of different kind of things, a lot of voices going around, leading people astray. We need to agree on what we believe the Scriptures are saying. And so, although again, for us, creeds are not authoritative, for us, they are a very helpful distillation of what is authoritative, our Scriptures. They called the Nicene Creed a symbol of faith, as in like something that, that you could look at and go, this is, this is what our faith is. We want to know what do we believe, especially about, like we'll look at today, who is Jesus? What did he do? What does that mean? That's what these overseers, these bishops, these pastors were trying to establish or help us understand so that we'd have a definitive answer across the globe, the, the Catholic Church. Again, little c Catholic, not, not Pope and whatnot. Across the, across the globe, as we are preaching, Paul did this, you may remember. In Acts, it's reported Paul went and preached to the Gentiles. And then after his ministry to the Gentiles, he's like, I better go to the, to the other apostles back to Jerusalem. I better find out that what I am preaching is actually the true and accurate and saving gospel of Jesus. I've got to make sure that what I'm preaching is true. So he went to the Council of, Council of Apostles and Elders in Jerusalem and said, is what I'm saying true? And they said, yes, keep preaching it. And they said, just remember a couple of things, but this is right. And then fast forward about 300 years and you get to Nicaea and you get to this gathering and they, they establish or already codify this symbol of faith. It's not to say that you have to know everything in the creed to be a Christian. This is not a test of your faith. 
There's not, a, there's, not a, there's not an exam you have to pass. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. The test has been passed already by our King and our Saviour, Jesus. It's wonderful news. So what, what they weren't trying to do is establish a test to see, to see that you're a Christian. However, I will say, <clears throat> as we look through this creed, the Nicene Creed, if we deny anything in this creed, then we are outside the faith. So this, this isn't a test of faith as in you've got to know everything in order to be in, but it is a kind of a plumb line of are we accurately reflecting the Scriptures as taught by the apostles, the faith as it was handed down to us? Are we, do we accurately believe it? Are we believing in the actual Jesus who actually lived, actually died, actually rose again, actually ascended and actually saved us? And so again, we don't want to, we don't want to raise the creed too high to the level of Scripture or, or to the level of a test. However, we, the, the creed is important for us because it helps us understand, is the Jesus we believe in the actual Jesus of heaven? All righty, let's, let's read it. So again, Nicaea, about 325 AD, northern modern Turkey is where Nicaea is. The... the Bishops got together. Even the emperor of Rome got there because it was so important. Rome, like the Roman Empire had started to fracture because the church was starting to fracture. And the emperor said, man, as the church goes, our empire seems to be going. We need to get unity back in the church. <clears throat> and so um, let's read it together. It's going to appear up on the screen. It's going to be in the app again later with a bunch of... Uh, Verses that are going to help you as well. So let's read this together because again, this is a distillation of what we believe. It is really, really important. It helps us kind of like, kind of like a boundary marker so that as we're reading Scripture, where we read a part of Scripture that seems to highlight Jesus' divinity, we don't minimise His humanity and err outside of the faith. Or we read something that seems to highlight Jesus' humanity, we don't start to doubt His divinity and err outside the faith. And so again, this creed is so important to us. It's been used by pretty much every church, even the Roman Catholic Church use this. The Orthodox Church mostly use this. The Protestant Church of the Reformation and since use this. It's the things that we do universally agree on, but it also helps us to establish those boundaries so that we know that, as we'll read, people who deny the divinity of Jesus outside the faith. So like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses outside the faith or the nature of the triune God, or the natures of Jesus. It helps us to establish, actually, we need to make sure we are actually in the faith. All right, let's well said. Let's read it together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. Can you read that? Is that all right? It's a bit low. Just stick your head up a bit more. All right. Maker of heaven and earth. Oh, sorry, here we are. We believe in... One Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So as we read through that, you might think, oh, that sounded pretty similar to the Apostles' Creed last week. And, and in fact, there is a lot that's in there 
uh, from the Apostles' Creed, but subsequent to the Apostles' Creed being established, again, people had started to preach and to write and to teach things that were contrary to Scripture. So what we're going to do is we're just going to read through this and highlight those three aspects of the Creed. What are they trying to do? Uh, who is Jesus specifically? And it, the Creed does talk about the nature of the triune God. But we won't go deep into that because next week's creed, the Athanasian Creed, talks about that a lot. So we'll highlight on Jesus today and highlight on the Trinity next week. Uh, so who is Jesus? What did he do? So what did he actually accomplish? And then what does that mean for us? What are the implications of that? You might notice there's, there's nothing in there about, um, like it talks about God created everything or Jesus created everything. Doesn't mention how he created it. It talks about uh, what's going to happen in the life everlasting. Doesn't talk about end times or mention millennium and things like this. And so none of those things we think are primary uh, doctrines. But everything that's in this creed, we would say is absolutely essential to say, yes, you are in the faith. You know the, the true God. You are, you are saved by God. So let me very quickly go through um, the who is Jesus, what did he do, where did he come from? But then along the way, I want to highlight some of the controversies that actually had arisen. What precipitated or what necessitated these people coming from all over the, the church to get together to actually decide this is so important that we need to expressly, explicitly say this is the Jesus of the Bible. So it starts with God, who is God, and then gets very quickly to Jesus. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. And you're probably thinking, first up, what does begotten mean? I remember begotten from like the KJV version of John 3.16 that I've heard in the past. I remember it from a couple of Christmas carols. Begotten. What, is, what does that even mean? Well, so this word begotten actually was one of the controversies. What does it mean to be begotten? We don't use this word uh, in our day. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever used this word begotten, like the, the English word begotten at least. But it, it comes down to what does it mean for Jesus to be divine? And there were actually a few different opinions about this. So some people thought, well, Jesus being divine just means that <clears throat> he is eternally, co-eternal with God the Father. That's what we believe. Some believe, well, there was a man who was born and God saw that he was, he, he was good, he was fit to be the Messiah. And so God came and indwelt him and he became divine. We don't believe that. Some believe that <clears throat> he was divine and human, but that he was separately divine and separately human. We don't believe that either. And so they're kind of, they're trying to figure out how do we describe the fact that Jesus is the same as God, but not created. And so they use this word, begotten. The word in Greek, monogenes. We do use the word mono, which means solo or, or, the, or the same or one. And genus we use for like a kind. What kind of, well, you know, what, what genus of animal is this? Perhaps we might say. And so a, a better translation perhaps for us in 2024 in Australia might be one of a kind or unique. His one of a kind son, monogenous. I think it's a much better way for us to understand or, or even um, as they'll come to describe in another place, one substance, so the same the same stuff, the same kind, the same substance as God. So mono for, for one or same. So it's either one of a kind or same substance that, to, that these people were trying to help us and the people in the day understand who is Jesus? He is fully God. Not a man who became God. Not a man, not a God who pretended even to be a man. Not a God who's subordinate even or a lesser kind of God to the real God. There are cults and sects who believe this, that yeah, there is a father 
out there, but He is too glorious and too great to be known. Uh, and so there's this other kind of God, more like we would think of like Marvel superhero kind of gods. From, you know, they're otherly, they're super special, they're different, they're not, they're not really like us, but he, he kind of became kind of like us. They're, they're helping us understand, no, monogenous, only begotten, one of a kind, of the same stuff, the same kind, only begotten. And so it starts with, we believe. We acknowledge In fact, this is the foundation of our faith, that Jesus is God himself. Not the totality of God, not not instead of God the Father and God the Son, not the one God appearing as Jesus sometimes and then appearing as a spirit sometimes and then appearing as a father sometimes. That was another heresy that they had to deal with. But fully God, eternally begotten of the Father, eternally begotten of the same kind as the Father. We read this in the Scripture, like John 1, 14. Uh, or even John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Or Hebrews, right in the beginning of Hebrews. In these last days, he's spoken through his son. God has appointed him heir of all things, made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So he is the word who sustains all things by his own power, by by himself. This is Jesus. Back to John 1, all things were made through him. And nothing that existed, existed without him making it. To accentuate the point, they go on, they say, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten or unique, same essence, not made of one being with the Father. They're again trying to highlight Jesus is not some afterthought, he's definitely not a created being. He's not at all like us in his divinity. He is God, the second person of the Godhead, the very word of God. So John 1 again, uh, from verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He is not just from God, he is God from God. He's God himself. Proceeding from God. And through him all things were made. So again, Colossians 1. For everything was created by him. This is Jesus. So not that he was a creation. And it's not the firstborn of creation as in he was the first created thing and then he created everything else. That means again, he's preeminent over creation. The sun is a radiance of God. Sorry, everything was created by him in heaven and on earth the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Again, they're trying to highlight his divinity. Jesus was not just a man. He didn't become God. He is God from God who became a man. It wasn't an angel who became a human, a superhuman who was elevated to God, not part God, part man, but Fully God, fully man. So the other controversy, uh, Arius, this guy, who he wasn't a bishop, but he was a pastor, apparently a pretty good communicator. And in fact, he, he would write songs uh, rich in theology from his understanding. And it, partly because these songs became so well sung across the Roman Empire that this doctrine, this false doctrine, this heresy really, started to spread and and grow its roots. So for me, kind of a sidebar for us today is, man, we've got to make sure when we are singing theology, that we're singing truth. it's, It's possibly the thing that made this such a divisive, fracturing and 
problematic issue in the early church. When we sing songs, <clears throat> songs are powerful, man. You, you will remember a song probably far better than you'll remember, say, this, this sermon or even any aspect of this sermon. Songs, especially catchy tunes, will just roll around in our heads over and over and over again. And when we participate in that, when we kind of sing them in our minds or sing them out loud, we are preaching to ourselves. And so the people in 324, just before this council, were singing lies about Jesus. And then they started believing lies about Jesus because they would remember them. That's what they would remember. Actually, part of the reason the, the creeds are so important, and even like the creed we'll see in 1 Corinthians 15, most likely it was sung, a creed that was sung. And the importance of singing creeds or singing good theology, again, is exactly that because it reminds us of the truth so that when we get to Scripture and we read something, again, that seems to highlight the humanity of Jesus, we don't veer off a cliff over here and forget about his divinity because the songs come to mind and we remind ourselves of the divinity of Jesus. Does this make sense? Man, we've got to be so careful with how we curate what goes into our minds, but especially what goes on in our minds. So Arius said it's sung that Jesus was divine, but not co-equal and not co-eternal with the Father. So it's kind of trying to you know, split it down the middle. Yeah, he was, he was special and divine, but not the same as God. Arius was already condemned, like seven years earlier. The bishops got together and like, nah, this, this is false teaching. But because of the power of his music, and because a couple of bishops got on board, it became a massive problem. Constantine, uh, legend has it, <laughs> again, there's a couple of legends from around this era, uh, that he said that uh, it's the songs echoing throughout the Roman Empire. And again, he was so concerned that the church was fracturing and his whole empire would fracture, that he was at this council making sure that these bishops got some unity. And they come up with this other word. <clears throat> so Bonagenus, we looked at again, so unique, of, of the same genus. The, the same, or one of a kind. They had another word as well. And this is, this is one of the ones that Santa got so passionate about as well. It's homoousia, or homoousion, which again means the same essence. Ontologically, you know, at the, at the core of their substance, they are the same. Not lesser, not created, not afterthought, not, not different. Distinction in person but not different in kind. Homo usion. Good, same essence. But then there's another one, uh, another word that Arius was trying to present, which is homo eusion. Very similar, just one little, one little I in there, which means similar essence. This is where they started to get off track. And again, side note for us, one little letter means the difference between telling prophetic truths about Jesus, the real Jesus, and telling lies about a, a gospel that has no power and a God that doesn't exist. We've got to be really, really careful. Again, that's why creeds are so helpful and so important for us. Same essence, homoousion. And when we get closer to Christmas, you'll see people posting memes about Santa and homoousion. And now you'll be in on the joke and be like, that's funny because he may have slapped Arius. Uh, but figuratively, they did slap Arius and they said, no, no, same essence. True light from true light, God from God. He, Jesus is God. And then secondly, what did he do? So that's who Jesus is. Now, what did he do? Is it for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. Actually, I might flip this and do the, the heresies first. So, oh, actually, I'll put it in. That's fine. So, so uh, there are a bunch of people who are believing different things about what Jesus did as well. So 
uh, there was Origen who said, well, actually Jesus, salvation is effective even for angels. And maybe even if Satan repented, he could be, he could be in as well. Or there was the Manichaeans who believed that um, Jesus assumed true flesh. Uh, sorry, J- Jesus only had this kind of phantasmic body. Like he appeared as a human, but he wasn't really a human. There's another one, uh, Photius, who, Photinus, I should say, who said that uh, Jesus who was just a man and not God at all. And then there's the Nestorians who said uh, that God dwelt in a man, but didn't actually become a man. So because there were these various teachings going on and the uh, bishops, the leaders wanted to actually say, no, 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 we've got to believe what was true about who Jesus is and what he did. They wrote the rest. So for us, or in the original, for men, not just biological men, but mankind, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. So it wasn't just that he was a man, but he actually came from heaven. And why did he come? For us was incarnate, so actually took on flesh. That's where the khan comes from, like chili con khan. It's the same, it's where we get the same words from, right? It took on flesh, took on meat. Didn't just look like us, he, he became one of us. Didn't lose his divinity, he added to his divinity, his humanity. Again, these are super important truths. Incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. Not a fake man. Didn't just appear as a man. He was fully God, fully man. Again, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word proceeding from God. God Himself, from God, became, took on flesh and dwelt among us. For our sake, again, for our sake, not for, not for a different genus, but for his image bearers. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. It wasn't a fake death. Didn't just appear to die. Didn't just, well, you know, he, he, he kind of took on flesh like a kind of a, like a, a clothing uh, but it wasn't really him. And then when he died, he didn't really, didn't really suffer. He didn't really die. No, 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 no. He really suffered. He really died. He, he actually took on flesh. He actually became like us. So that when he died, he could actually, literally die a death that we deserve. He has paid our penalty. He has died our death. That's why they're so keen in the creed to help us understand what really materially happened. So we can have full confidence that Jesus is God and he has paid our, paid our debt. Even Isaiah foretold it. 53, he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. Or John 19, then he handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. And later, there they crucified him. He actually died. Back to the creed. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scripture. So again, 1 Corinthians 15, from one of the first the proto-creeds, where Paul writes that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. Or Matthew 28, the angel told the woman, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. So again, the people said, well, yeah, Jesus, he died, but he didn't really have a, you know, a human body. So it's kind of not really a full death. But then some said, no, he, he was a man. And then he really did die. But when he rose again, he only rose spiritually. Not, or not a real physical body, just spiritually. And again, the creed, we, we see, no, no, no. He actually rose again with flesh glorified body. When Thomas touched him, it was real. Well, not, not an apparition. He was really there, really resurrected, physically glorified body of King Jesus. And again, that gives us solid hope that the, Jesus, the, the resurrection we hope in is a real resurrection. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
So again, we see this in, in Acts. After he said this, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of the sight, or Mark 16. So the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Or the writer of Hebrews, man, one of my favourite passages of all the scripture, where it talks about after he had finished the one time for all time sacrifice, that everything in the Old Testament, all the sacrificial system had had foreshadowed and was a type of and, and prophetically looked forward to and longed for. Once it was fulfilled in Jesus, He entered the throne room and sat, because His work was finished, He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Man, I love this picture of Jesus that is kind of ratified and codified in the creed, that He has done everything necessary. He really came from heaven. He really became a human. He did not lose His divinity. Fully God, fully man, really physically died the death we deserve. Really physically resurrected from the dead. Really physically seated at the right hand of the Father, at the, of the Father in heaven. With this wonderful promise that the things we believe are accurate and are true. And again, answering a bunch of these false teachers that were going on. And these weren't, these weren't malicious men who were like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whiz my way into the church and lead people astray. <laughs> None of that kind of stuff. These are people who were reading Scripture and going, oh, I think it says this. And so I'm going to teach that. And, and this is another warning for us. The winner just import our ideas into Scripture. There's something really that became very popular uh, in the last generation or so, last 10 to 15 years, uh, saying things like, you know, um, Christianity is it's not a religion, it's a relationship. And it is true that it is a relationship. What that's kind of come to mean over the years is we've now imported our understanding of relationships into our understanding of the faith. Where we're like, our relationships are, are mutual relationships. We come to them as even from a Christian understanding, co-image bearers, co-heirs with Jesus, become as equals. You know, male, female, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, we're actually, we're ontologically equal as image bearers and we're co-heirs with Christ. And so we, can't, we think about relationships as in, as, as in the mutuality, not just the mutual love and giving um, and even human to human, like that mutual submission out of reverence to Christ that Paul talks about to the church in Ephesus. But that we can actually say with our relationships, well, yeah, I, 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 this relationship might be helpful and so I come to it with my own thinking and my own understanding and, uh, and where this relationship is good for me, I will engage and where it's not, I will disengage. I come with, to bring my understanding where you, where you ratify my feelings and my understandings and my life. We can have a relationship or we don't. We might need to break relationship. But unfortunately, we have this understanding of relationship to God and we say, well, God, where you agree with me, where you're good by my understanding, where I read scripture uh, according to how I like it and I disregard what I don't like or I'll import my understanding, what we do is we actually create a God in our image. We, we, we don't look at our imaging after God, but rather we make a God in our image. And we say, well, I... If you've ever said or heard someone say, I could only be, or I could never believe in a God who, dot, 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 you've probably made a God in your, in your own image. And again, the creeds help us to not fall off the cliff in any direction. And even when we're reading the scriptures, these men, like Arius wasn't trying to, he wasn't attempting to deceive people about Jesus. He was trying to teach them according to his understanding of who Jesus was just happen to be false. It's one of the reasons we need each other. One of the reasons we, we need the creeds to help us understand, are we in the faith? Do we understand what it is we're reading? So thirdly, what does this mean for us? As I go into the creed, it says, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, or the, like the old English, the quick and the dead. 
which is where that saying comes from. And his kingdom will have no end. So again, they're not trying to tell us about the millennium or uh, any, any of those kind of controversies or tertiary or secondary doctrine. They're trying to say, what do we all agree on? He is coming back. And there will be judgment. Get this from Matthew 25 and 2 Timothy 4. It says, when we believe in the Holy Spirit, actually, this is added a bit later in, uh, uh, in Constantinople, 381. They got together and they're like, okay, it's been a few years now since we established the creed. We think it's done its work. We, you know, the, the Aryan controversy has been dealt with. Homoousion is great. Uh, monogenous, it's great. We have, you know, unity again. And so uh, what, what's kind of missing now? Let's add this a little bit about the Holy Spirit so that we can help people understand the triune nature of God. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. You might have noticed that was in parentheses, wasn't in the original, but by Constantinople, a couple of years later, they're like, yeah, and, and the Son. We want to make sure people understand this. Actually, that phrase would then lead to another big fracture in the church about five, 700 years later who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshipped and glorified. So again, they're saying, and the Spirit himself is also a a distinct person, but the same substance, the same essence. He is God, the Holy Spirit. God the Son, God the Father. Three persons, one God. That's what they're trying to help us understand. And the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son to us. This is what it means for us. See this in John 14. But the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. Or 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And many, many, many more. And again, he says, uh, who spoke by the prophets, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So the baptism for the remission of sins doesn't mean that you are saved by baptism. Uh, You can see like in 2 Peter 3, which we've covered before, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a remover of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's not the baptism materially that does the saving, but the baptism which shows the the clear conscience because of the saving grace through faith of Jesus. Or in Acts, where I think Peter preaching says, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in a moment, 1 Corinthians 15, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. So, again, what are we, what's the implication of the creed, of the gospel? in the bounds of the creed, like the true faith, is that we have this sure hope, not a vague, vain wish about a future resurrection, but because Jesus physically rose from the dead and promised us we will raise from the dead likewise. We can trust that he is who he said he is because he raised from the dead and that we will also raise physically but with glorified bodies. So for you, you might go, uh, you know, what will my body actually look like? We'll, we'll actually spend a bit of time on this when we get to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, but be assured, your body now, but glorified. Same body glorified. So Jesus, in his glorified body, has still holes in his hands and his feet, right? So there's a sense in which, you know, things carry over. And even Jesus says, it's better to cut off your hand or poke out your eye and go into the new earth without an arm or without an eye than to be thrown in the fire of Gehenna. But we do know that our boys' bodies will be glorious and glorified. Revelation 21, he'll wipe away every tear from your eye. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. So this is just a very brief overview of the creed. But man, the creed, this creed is awesome and powerful. Not because it's authoritative again, but because it's a distillation of the things we hold to be true that help us to reject falsehood, 
to reject things, even that sound good, or songs that might kind of whistle their way into your mind, but have bad theology and, and telling lies about Jesus, so that we, as we, and, and I, I would encourage you to become very familiar or even to memorize the Creed, so that when you're reading scripture, when you're listening to songs, when you're talking to friends, and they say things, you're like, oh man, that, that doesn't sound right. That's not the faith as it was handed down to us that, that the church universally has believed. Even as we believe different kinds of things in different like tertiary and, and secondary doctrinal areas that we might disagree and even separate over different things, we all agree on these things. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Actually died, actually rose, actually ascended. Rules and reigns will come again to, ju- to judge the living and the dead and we will rise with him with resurrected bodies forever. So is anyone up there? Yeah, can we read it again? This time now we have a little bit of understanding of it. Let's read it again and let's ask God to help these words seep into our hearts and our minds so that when we speak, we're speaking things in light of what we believe. When we make decisions, we're making decisions in light of what we believe. When we, even when we relate to God, it's so powerful. It helps us understand who God is and what He's done for us so that, we, so that we don't grovel to Him. We see because of His love for us, Jesus came. For us, He died. He, he, it's wonderful. He loves us. So we come to God in light of what we know. Man, it helps us to, to run to Him and not hide from Him. Let's read it together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, He rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And the amen means so let it be or truly. This, this is true. We agree. Might be another like a modern translation. We agree. I say we do agree. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for those leaders, those bishops who didn't pursue a fake kind of unity of niceness where everybody seems to get along but everybody does whatever they want preaches whatever lies or or misunderstandings they can come up with, but rather they fought for a true unity. One God, one spirit, one baptism, one Lord over all things. Thank you for, for these people who at great cost to themselves um, would, would help us even 1,700 years later to know who you are, who Jesus is, what he has done, and what that means for us still even today. And, and God, we declare you are, you are God over all things. You're certainly our God, our Saviour, our Father, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending him, for his obedience. 
and praise Him as co-eternal, as God the Son. Thank you for what He accomplished in His life and His death, the promise of His resurrection and the life everlasting. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes from you and from Jesus. Thank you for promising Him and delivering Him. We acknowledge you, Spirit, as God the Spirit, third person of the Trinity, here with us, working in us to receive the gift of grace through faith, to give us the power to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, as a guarantee and a deposit that we belong to Jesus, in working in us to make us more like Jesus, carrying out your sanctifying work, in working through us with fruit and gifts for the building up of the body and the proclamation of of the glory of God. You are so, so good to us, God. So we want to dedicate ourselves to believing true things about you, saying true things about you, so that our words would be spirit-filled and prophetic, so the word would go out even from us, have its effect in people as the gospel is proclaimed and the implications of the gospel are lived out in us. Help us to be people of uh, the book, people of your scriptures, but that we wouldn't read in our own understanding what we want to be true from a fleshly perspective, but that we would read, and as we read, you'd speak to us, that would be congruent with uh, the gospel the apostles taught and, and it's been handed down to us faithfully, generation after generation. Please, Father, help us to be aware of when we hear things that aren't true, that we wouldn't receive those. We don't want to be combatant. We don't want to be, we don't want to be jerks about it, Father, but help us to be winsome and clear when we hear things that aren't true. Help us to reject um, even, even uh, appealing music where it's presenting things that aren't true about who you are and who Jesus is or what you've done for us. But that we would be singing songs that bring you glory and are building us up. And Father, we look forward to the day you bring this age to an end and the new, the new earth and new heavens are made. We receive our glorified bodies. You wipe away every tear. We look forward to it. Would you speed that day? In Jesus' name, amen.